So, uh, good morning. I'm Dr. Paul Mason, and I'm a sports and exercise medicine physician from Sydney. And today we're going to explore the science of ketogenic diets and address the myth that low fat diets are good for weight loss. And we're going to learn how to reverse the supposedly irreversible type 2 diabetes and discover exactly what it is about vegetable oils that makes them toxic. And I'd like to start by introducing a cognitive psychologist, Dr. T. This is Dr. T. Now, who here thinks she looks lazy? Or greedy? Of course, this is a ridiculous question. You can't possibly tell just by looking at her. And yet, that is the conclusion that many people would come to when they looked at an old photo of her. And this is because we've been indoctrinated that obesity is a conscious decision. That choosing to be greedy and lazy is the sole reason that most people become obese. Now, it's not exactly as if Dr. T wasn't motivated to lose weight. It was having a massive impact on the quality of her life. It was miserable every day. I can't remember a day I didn't wake up and think, I'll just start a diet on Monday, or if I could just fix my weight problem, I could get my life together. Clearly, she also wasn't overweight because she didn't exercise. Well, I always rode to and from work, which was about 25 to 30k round trip. We would plan holidays that were cycling holidays. Um, I would walk. I had a dog. I would walk my dog for an hour in the afternoon. I would go to the gym. I signed up with weight management clinics at the university I worked with, where I would work with exercise physiology students and dietitians. So I would be going, and I was the one who always showed up. I never missed a session. I was there all the time. And then I would go on the days I didn't have to go. And nor was she overweight because she didn't follow medical advice. I've tried all the diets. I've tried the eating plans. I've tried drugs. I tried Xenical. My doctor at one stage wanted to put me on amphetamines, but I kind of value my brain a bit too much for that. And by my 40s, things were so out of control that I actually tried bariatric surgery. I went in and had a lap band because I thought, honestly, I thought the worst case, I won't get any fatter. And the best case, by some miracle, I may actually get back to a normal size. And even that failed. And despite all of these failed attempts, Dr. T eventually found a way to succeed and got her life back. At my heaviest, I was 133 kilos. And I've lost 55 kilos to date. My life is so much better. I feel so much healthier. Every aspect of it is better. And the best part about it is, I don't feel like my eating is out of control. So the question is, what did she do? Well, clearly, it wasn't following conventional medical wisdom, because following this advice had only led her to get fatter and sicker. No, her breakthrough came when she understood that obesity is not so much about calories as it is about insulin. And let's take a look at the evidence that insulin, a hormone secreted into our blood, can make us fat. This is a picture of a 34-year-old female who had an insulinoma a tumour producing insulin. In this picture, she's 107 kilograms and she's only 152 centimetres tall. And then she had surgery to remove the tumour. This stopped the excess insulin production and over the next 50 days, she lost 18 kilograms without any change in diet or exercise, just reduced insulin levels. And anyone who's ever had to inject insulin understands that it stimulates fat storage Continued injection of insulin into the same site over a period of time often leads to a condition called lipohypertrophy, quite literally fat enlargement. Here you can see the localised accumulation of fat tissue at different insulin injection sites, and about a quarter of every type 1 diabetic patient will develop this. And high insulin levels in the blood is highly predictive of future weight gain. This study followed initially lean subjects for eight years to see who developed obesity. Those who were in the lowest 25% for their insulin levels at the start and end of the eight year period had only a 2% chance of becoming obese. 
What about those in the highest 25%? They had a risk of becoming obese of over 70%. And on average, they were 50% heavier. So if high insulin levels plays an important role in obesity, it's only logical to ask, what raises insulin levels? And the answer is found in our diet, or more precisely, the carbohydrate content of our diet. When we eat fat, we only get a small rise in insulin levels. We get somewhat of a larger response for protein, which is actually a good thing because insulin helps build our lean tissues like muscle. But it's when we get to carbohydrates that the story starts getting really interesting. When we directly compare the insulin release by carbohydrates and fat, we understand why carbohydrates are fattening and fat itself is not. And one of the reasons why insulin levels impact our weight gain is that because amongst other things, it helps regulate our involuntary energy expenditure, even at rest. And this was elegantly shown in this recent study where subjects were allocated to either a low 20%, moderate 40%, or a high 60% carbohydrate diet. And then the investigators did something really interesting. They adjusted the energy intake of the subjects to prevent any weight change. And what they found was that the low carbohydrate group in blue actually had an increased energy expenditure. And this compared to the high carbohydrate group in red, which had a reduced energy expenditure. And the difference between these two groups was very significant, about 278 kilocalories a day. And this is basically equivalent to the amount of energy expended in one hour of moderate intensity exercise. In fact, 278 kilocalories a day would translate into a 10 kilogram weight loss over three years in a 30 year old man. And this is not an isolated finding. In fact, amongst high quality randomized controlled trials, you could even say there's a consensus. Using the definitions of low carb as less than 130 grams a day and low fat as less than 35% energy, let's have a look at the available evidence. So between 2003 and 2018, there were 62 randomized control trials that compared weight loss on either a low carb or a low fat diet. And of these 62 studies, 31 of them did not find statistically significant results, which means 31 did. And here I've graphed the results of all of these 31 studies. The blue bars represent the amount of weight loss in the low carb group and the adjacent red bar represents the amount of weight lost in the low fat group. And if you look at each pair of results, you'll see that the low carb arms lost more weight in all of them. All of them. Not one single study with statistically significant results found in favour of low fat diets for weight loss. So if you were wanting to lose weight, which diet would you choose? Now let's take a closer look at carbohydrates. Most of us instinctively know that sugar can be bad for us. But did you realise that carbohydrates are literally made of sugar? Just a string of glucose molecules? Even complex carbs such as brown rice and sweet potato contain this glucose. And when we digest these carbs, each and every one of these glucose molecules will end up in our bloodstream. Now this may not necessarily pose a problem. First of all, we can actually metabolise or burn some of the glucose, and we can also store some in our muscle and liver as glycogen. In fact, healthy people can store about 80% of the glucose as glycogen. But this all changes if we have too much carbohydrate. And in this study, subjects were deliberately fed too much carbohydrate, just to see what would happen. Well, some of the carbohydrate was oxidised or burned, as you can see in the blue bars, but this was relatively constant right through the duration of the study, right through to day eight, meaning that putting more carbohydrates into the system did not increase how much was burnt. And some of the glucose that wasn't burnt was stored as glycogen, as we've already seen. But this capacity was reduced over subsequent days as the stores progressively filled up until by day six, there was no spare storage capacity at all. What then happened with the leftover carbohydrate? Well, that was turned into fat via this process called de novo lipogenesis. 
And as the storage capacity continued to reduce, this fat production continued to increase. And this is an example of the fat that was produced, a triglyceride fat. And this triglyceride can be carried around in our circulation. So now we have a trifecta, three things from eating carbs, increased blood glucose levels, increased insulin levels, and circulating triglycerides. And these are three key ingredients for the storage of fat. So each and every fat cell in the body is in contact with blood vessels, and that exposes them to these circulating factors, the glucose, the insulin, the triglycerides. Let's see what happens. Let's look at triglycerides first. In its complete form, it's unable to enter the fat cell. And this is where insulin comes in. Insulin stimulates this enzyme here, lipoprotein lipase, which then cleaves the larger molecule and allows these fatty acids to then diffuse across into the fat cell. Insulin also activates this GLUT4 transporter, which is like a gate that allows glucose to enter the fat cell. And once inside the fat cell, the glucose is converted into glycerol. This then combines with the fatty acids to reform a triglyceride. And this is how fat is stored, under the influence of insulin. But if you want to lose weight, then the triglyceride must be sliced up again to allow it to exit the fat cell for metabolism. And this requires activity of an enzyme called hormone-sensitive lipase. And this separates the glycerol from the fatty acids, allowing them to leave the fat cell. Insulin blocks this enzyme, puts the brakes on it. And without this step, the fat can't be metabolized. Insulin blocks fat burning. So putting it all together, we can see that insulin pushes fatty acids and glucose into fat cells. And then for extra insult, it prevents them from leaving, a triple whammy. So clearly insulin has the capacity to stimulate fat storage. But where this fat is deposited is probably even more important than the amount of fat. Shown in red here is what is known as visceral fat in and around the organs. And it's this pattern of fat deposition most strongly associated with liver disease and type 2 diabetes. In fact, for every one kilogram increase in visceral fat, the risk of diabetes in males is doubled. And for females, quadrupled. Process that for a second. As a female, if you were to have one extra kilogram of visceral fat, your risk of diabetes would be increased by four times. And this is because fatty liver disease directly contributes to something called insulin resistance, which is at the heart of type 2 diabetes. Now, it's worth focusing for a moment on just what exactly insulin resistance means. So it refers to our tissues being resistant to the effects of insulin. In other words, the insulin that we have just doesn't work as well. And to compensate, our pancreas releases more. So insulin resistance can often be identified by the high levels of insulin that result from this compensatory response. Now, we know that insulin is able to stimulate the storage of glucose in muscle and liver as glycogen. But in the case of insulin resistance, this storage is impaired and we end up with higher levels of glucose in the circulation. And this excess blood glucose can be turned into fat through the process of de novo lipogenesis. And here we see the degree of de novo lipogenesis following a high carbohydrate meal in healthy subjects without insulin resistance. And the response for the same meal in insulin resistant subjects more than doubled. And this is a direct consequence of the insulin resistance associated with fatty liver. Fortunately, visceral fat and fatty liver is extremely sensitive to weight loss on a low carbohydrate diet. This is a DEXA scan of one of my patients. And you can see the visceral fat concentrated around the region of the liver. Now, after going on a low carb diet and losing only 9% body weight, you can see a big reduction in the visceral fat stores. And this effect is even seen on low carb diets, even when we deliberately overfeed to prevent weight loss, we get this redistribution of fat. We also see it with exercise, which while it doesn't reliably lead to weight loss, certainly leads to this redistribution of fat. And that's how we're beginning to understand why some people can be metabolically healthy and still be overweight. 
And of course, the reverse is also true. It's possible to be skinny and metabolically unwell, what we call TOFI, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And this is clearly demonstrated on these DEXA scans. The man on the left has a BMI of only 25, and yet he's got masses of visceral fat. The man on the right has a BMI of 30, technically obese, and yet he's only got one third of the amount of visceral fat. And this only serves to illustrate the limitations of using BMI to assess metabolic health. Much more accurate and very simple is just simply a tape measure around the waist, abdominal circumference. This better reflects visceral mass. And there's also other signs, other external signs of insulin resistance we can have a look at. Let's hear from Dr. T again. And everybody I speak to has no idea that skin tags are a pretty good indicator of insulin resistance. They all go, oh, really? Unfortunately, this is not common knowledge. I've lost count of the number of patients who come in with skin tags who tell me the story that their doctor doesn't know what causes them, but is still very, very keen to burn them off. We can also see this characteristic pattern of skin pigmentation called acanthosis nigricans. It's usually in the armpits or in the groin. Sometimes it's on the back of the fingers, around the neck. Acne is also associated with insulin resistance, and this is a major benefit that many of my younger patients often report. There's also laboratory testing we can do for insulin resistance. And in my clinic, I measure both glucose and insulin levels over two hours after giving them a drink of glucose, 75 grams. And this allows me to grade the severity of insulin resistance. And it falls on a continuum from very mild insulin resistance without a rise in blood sugar, all the way up to full-blown insulin-dependent type 2 diabetes. So let's look at the standard testing for diabetes. And that only looks at glucose levels. And the problem with only looking at glucose levels is that even with the onset of insulin resistance, the compensatory increase in insulin levels usually keeps glucose levels within the normal range for quite some time. And this graph is an example of glucose levels in a typical diabetic patient in the years leading up to their diagnosis. You can see that the glucose doesn't really rise until about 10 years, at which point prediabetes may finally be diagnosed. What happens if we look at insulin levels over the same period of time? We can detect the problem much earlier. Here we see the progressive increase in insulin levels which occurs in response to the resistance. And this most commonly occurs as a result of excess carbohydrate. Then, as the pancreas which secretes the insulin begins to fail, insulin levels fall. Let's now look at glucose and insulin levels together. This vertical dashed line represents a state where both glucose and insulin levels are normal. And over time, with the onset of insulin resistance, insulin levels rise but blood sugar is still normal. So on a standard blood test only looking at glucose, everything still looks hunky-dory, not even pre-diabetic. But looking at the insulin level, we can begin to see a problem. Finally, the increase in insulin levels can't completely compensate for the insulin resistance and blood glucose levels begin to rise. And this is when pre-diabetes is conventionally diagnosed, often a decade or more after insulin resistance has begun to occur. All the while, the patient has probably been suffering the effects of high insulin levels such as weight gain and increasing blood pressure. Then, as the cells in the pancreas begin to fail, insulin secretion falls. And the combined state of reduced insulin levels and insulin resistance often leads to a precipitous rise in blood sugar levels. And this is where diabetes is diagnosed, possibly two decades after it all began. Fortunately, this process is reversible on a low-carb diet. And these are the insulin results of one of my patients on one of these two-hour tests. And this is the results of the same patient six months later after commencing a low-carb diet. You can see big reductions in insulin levels. And unsurprisingly, this was associated with 17 kilos of weight loss. And I've seen this type of response countless times. And what about the impact of a low-carb diet on blood sugar levels? given this is how diabetes is formally diagnosed. Let's hear from Dr. T again. I had type 2 diabetes in June last year. It was reversed by August. I was 5.8 by August. So she's talking about her HbA1c, which is a marker of average blood sugar levels. And she took hers from 8.1 to 5.8, which is an excellent response. And this is consistent with diabetes reversal. 
And this graph here shows how rapid the improvements can be. This graph was recorded by a 71-year-old gentleman who dropped his morning fasting blood glucose levels quite literally in half in only two weeks. And all the while, he stopped two diabetic medications over the same period. And this study here confirms the reversal of diabetes is possible on scale. The grey line shows the average blood sugar level in patients receiving standard diabetic care over a two-year period. The light blue line shows the average sugar levels of diabetic patients on a low-carb diet. And you can clearly see that those receiving standard diabetic care had significantly higher blood sugar levels over the two-year period. In fact, at two years, 53% of the patients on the low-carb diet met the criteria for diabetes reversal. Now, given that most of the glucose in our circulation comes from what we eat, it's possible to see major improvements quite literally overnight when we start a low-carb diet. And this is a continuous glucose monitor sensor. It sits on the back of the upper arm and has a small painless needle which senses glucose levels. And it communicates wirelessly with a smartphone or a dedicated reader device and provides 24-hour real-time blood sugar monitoring. And this is a readout from a continuous glucose monitor from one of my patients the day before starting a low-carb diet. And a couple of days later, you can see the vast improvements in the stability of sugar levels. And this kind of stability is perhaps even more important than the absolute level because it's the variations in the blood sugar levels which also generate significant amounts of oxidative stress, which, as we'll soon see, causes problems in and of itself. And I do recommend these monitors to a lot of patients, to anybody who's curious about their personal blood sugar response to specific foods. And it's also a great compliance tool. You can't pretend that something is OK. The evidence there is staring you in the face. And it's what I call real-time accountability. And for many patients, this helps them stick to a low-carb diet. I'd like to now shift gears and have a look at processed foods. And processed foods actually now make up more than half of the consumed dietary energy in most westernised countries, high-income countries. Now, despite often being disguised behind packaging making various health claims, they're really not that good for us. And when I think about processed foods, I think of two key ingredients, sugar and vegetable oils, or more correctly, seed oils. Let's start with sugar. Now, sugar or sucrose is a problem because it contains fructose exactly 50%, in fact, which is very comparable to the amount of fructose in high fructose corn syrup. So we don't get away with it in Australia. And the first problem is that fructose is very sweet, even compared to glucose. So fructose is actually about two and a half times sweeter than glucose. And this means that fructose is more rewarding to us. This pathway in the brain, the mesolimbic pathway, is activated by sweet taste. It's a reward pathway. And there's no doubt that a degree of addiction contributes to both cravings and overeating related to this pathway in the state of obesity. And almost paradoxically, in obesity, the dopamine receptors are reduced. So you can see on this brain scan, there's less dopamine receptors in the brain of the obese individual than there is in the normal weight individual. This means that for the same level of reward, an obese person needs to consume either more or sweeter foods. And this is part of the pathway that drives them to things like sugar and fructose. And fructose is involved in both causing this process and continuing this cycle. Fructose consumption also leads to much more fat production. Remember that de novo lipogenesis? Well, as we know, in a metabolically healthy state, most of the glucose can be taken up by the liver and by muscle tissues. And only about 20% will actually contribute to de novo lipogenesis. Fructose, on the other hand, has no capacity to be stored. All the fructose you ingest will contribute to fat production via this de novo lipogenesis. And fructose can be hidden. These are all different names for sugars, most of them containing fructose that are used in food labelling. Take, for example, this almond milk. 
boldly proclaiming that it contains no cane sugar. But when we look at the ingredients, we find this, organic agave syrup. And this is actually even worse than sucrose because it contains 75% fructose. And typical of many processed foods, it also contains vegetable oil. Why? I don't know. But this poses a significant issue. And it's not solely due to the omega-6 fat content. So vegetable oils are high in linoleic acid, which is an omega-6 fat. And it was assumed by many, including myself, that this linoleic acid would be converted first to arachidonic acid and then to these inflammatory molecules down the bottom called eicosanoids. The problem with this line of thinking, though, is that arachidonic acid is only converted to these inflammatory molecules if there's an inflammatory trigger of sorts. That is, the production of leukotrienes, thromboxanes, and prostaglandins needs an inflammatory stimuli. It requires activation of these enzymes that occur in inflammatory states. And in a low inflammatory state, such as on a low carbohydrate diet, these enzymes are less active. So arachidonic acid in and of itself is not inherently inflammatory. And it can actually increase in low inflammatory state. It's also likely that stabilisation of blood glucose levels on a low carb diet by reducing the oxidative stress actually reduces the damage to the arachidonic acid in our cell membranes, also increasing the levels. And this is exactly what we see. So in this recent study comparing low carb and high carbohydrate diets, we can see the low carb intervention actually had significantly higher levels of plasma arachidonic acid than the high carb diet. And furthermore, arachidonic acid is essential for good health. It's an essential component of our cell membranes. And among other things, it's involved in muscle repair and growth and the growth and repair of neurons. So the problem with vegetable oils is not the omega-6 content itself but the tendency for vegetable oils to become oxidised. So when we have a look at saturated fats, they're quite resistant to oxidation because they lack double bonds between the carbon atoms. But when we have a look at unsaturated fats, they do have these double bonds which are very reactive and prone to oxidation. And the more double bonds a fat has, the more likely it is to be oxidised. Here we can see the tendency of fats to oxidise with cooking ranging from the largely saturated fat lard on the left through to the polyunsaturated sunflower oil with multiple double bonds on the right. And you can see that olive oil in the third column with its single double bond sits somewhere in the middle. And even if you don't cook vegetable oils, they're still prone to oxidation. This study measured progressive oxidation in walnut oil stored over eight days. And you can see a massive increase in oxidation products in a matter of days. And this is why vegetable oils have antioxidants added to them. Even then though, the oxidation is only reduced and it's not completely eliminated. And after you ingest oxidized oils, you absorb them. They get absorbed through the small intestine in particles called chylomicrons, whereupon they get transported in the circulation to the liver. And this oxidised load to the liver activates an inflammatory response and ultimately it leads to, it contributes to insulin resistance. And it should be noted that these inflammatory effects are not isolated to the liver. It also occurs in other organs such as the kidneys and the lungs. And this graph here compares the absorption of oxidised fats to these chylomicrons between a meal containing low oxidation levels and a meal with high oxidised levels. And clearly we can absorb these oxidation products. And this is an electron microscope picture of a mouse liver showing how these oxidised fats can accumulate in the liver. And this accumulation is associated with a pronounced inflammatory response and the development of fatty liver. And here you can see fibrosis typical of fatty liver immediately adjacent to oxidised fats. And we also see clear evidence of this in humans. This is TPN, total parenteral nutrition. And this is used for people who can't digest food in normal ways. And we try and give them their complete nutritional requirements through a vein. Now, typical of most TPN infusions, this bag contains 20% fat, most of which is the highly oxidizable omega-6. And quite predictably, 
Infusion of TPN with its rich content of oxidized fats leads to liver disease. This study looked at rates of liver disease in those on TPN therapy over a few years. And the amount that the line drops by represents the number of people developing liver problems. And you can see that the percentage of people with biopsy proven liver disease after seven years of TPN therapy was about 60%. And this trend showed no signs of stopping. And in fact, several patients died of liver disease over the course of this study. So clearly, the ingestion of oxidized vegetable oils is probably not good for the liver. Do you know what could be worse though? The consumption of oxidized oils if you're a poorly controlled diabetic. This bar represents the degree of oxidation products absorbed into chylomicrons following a meal of oxidized corn oil in, a healthy, in healthy subjects. This bar here, the same meal of oxidized corn oil in well-controlled type 2 diabetics. And if you're a poorly controlled type 2 diabetic, then all bets are off. And this is why control of blood sugar is so important. If you're a poorly controlled diabetic consuming vegetable oils, you're on a hiding to nothing. So then what to do? Well, first of all, keep your blood sugar level low and get your polyunsaturated fats from fresh food. So long as the food you're eating is not rancid, which is actually the definition of rancidity is oxidized fats, you're probably going to be okay. And this doubly applies to omega-3s, which are even more prone to oxidation than omega-6s. So you've got a choice between supplements, which are probably oxidized, or fresh food. And you might also want to discuss with your doctor something like melatonin, which is a potent antioxidant. And predictably, it's actually been shown in research to reliably reverse fatty liver disease. Now, some of you will have heard all of this, and you'll still be uncomfortable with the idea of eating saturated fat. Well, this prospective study looked at more than 135,000 participants and followed them for seven years and looked at saturated fat consumption and mortality rates. And it found that those habitually consuming about 10% of their calories from saturated fat, not much, had a death rate of about seven people for every 1,000 person years. But in those who were consuming more than three times as much saturated fat, the equivalent death rate was only four. And there was no upper level of saturated fat intake which appeared problematic. As energy from saturated fat increased, so too did the benefits. And yes, I know that saturated fat can increase LDL cholesterol. And no, that doesn't matter either. This systematic review from 2016 looked at 19 cohort studies with over 68,000 participants. And of those 19 studies, 16 of them found an inverse relationship between the level of LDL cholesterol and risk of mortality. That is, the higher the LDL level, the lower the risk of dying. And 14 of those studies reached statistical significance, meaning this finding was very unlikely to be due to chance. So to close, remember that obesity is treatable and diabetes is reversible. All you have to do is limit your carbohydrates, especially sugar, avoid vegetable oils, and embrace saturated fat. A pretty simple recipe. And I'd also like to offer a public thanks to Dr. T, who shared her journey in the hope that it might help others suffering from the same problems and issues that she did. If you're a doctor, please be open to the possibility that what you learnt in medical school may be wrong. <laughs> and if your patients come to you wanting to try keto, support them. Their lives might depend on it. Thank you. <laughs>